Whenever mankind embarked in any kind of new creative endeavor, it always takes the law a little while to catch up. It's often difficult for the law to keep up with technology just because it moves so fast. Uh, and video games, when they first came out, uh, there was no rules really governing it. Is it software? Is it art? Is it a toy? Uh, no one was really sure what it was. It's still a weird medium in that it mashes together all of these different media to create something that makes it really hard to legislate and sort of determine who owns what intellectual property. In the history of video games, there have been hundreds of lawsuits. There were lawsuits before the term video game was even used. So these are kind of like the growing pains that happen in a new industry. And because everything was so fuzzy and unclear back then, you know, some people could get away with murder and other people, they got sued just by walking out the front door in the morning. So the first commercial video game system was the Magnavox Odyssey, created by this guy, Ralph Baer who decided that he was gonna go ahead and patent an electronic controllable game projected on a TV, which is basically the guy trying to patent video games. It's as if Gutenberg had patented the whole idea of books. This whole medium was patented, video games. No one even knew this was gonna be an industry or an artistic medium. They just thought this was a bunch of consumer electronic products that would sell for two seasons and then just disappear. But because they had these patents, Magnavox was actually able to wring licensing fees for a couple of years out of companies like Atari for stuff like Pong. All right, so if Magnavox basically came out and patented the entire medium of video games. Tari took it a step further and said, all right, we're gonna start patenting genres. One of the most famous early legal intellectual property cases with video games involved Pac-Man. Obviously, Pac-Man was a huge arcade hit back in 1980, and it took him a year or two to end up on home consoles, which he eventually did for the Atari 2600. But in the meantime, Magnavox had come out with a game for the Magnavox Odyssey 2 called Casey Munchkin. Casey Munchkin was a game in which you moved a cartoonish character around a maze collecting dots. Atari decided there couldn't be two maze games, so they sued the makers of Casey Munchkin Phillips, and they actually won. And they tried to work this angle where, oh, you can't do your product because it's too close to my product. In reality, it's kind of like saying, oh, I did Star Trek, so you can't do Star Wars because they're both about guys in space shooting aliens. I mean, some of the best games of all time, right? Like Galaxian and, and Galaga. Tato could have sued them saying, oh, you infringed on shooting aliens that are coming down in rows, you know, after Space Invaders. It's the same basic principle. It just doesn't fly, but it worked back then because the medium was so new. So it's really too bad that Casey Munchkin got shut down because it was actually a better game. And frankly, Pac-Man for the 2600 was a big steamy pile, so. The legal thinking went the other way in the case of Data East versus Epics, where Data East had a game called Karate Champ, and then Epics had a game called World Championship Karate. They were both basically two guys standing on opposite ends of an arena karate chopping each other, kind of looked alike, and they had kind of similar gameplay, the kind you would find in any sort of fighting game. And the courts, in this case, realized that Data East's Karate Champ and Epics's World Championship Karate were different properties playing in the same genre. The court actually ruled that if a 17 and a half year old kid can tell the difference between these two games, then it was okay to have two games that were really similar. The legal test was if a reasonably intelligent person could distinguish between the two products. But if you show my mom Guitar Hero, she still thinks it looks just like Mario, so. Data East didn't go away empty handed. They actually learned something from this and years later started churning out their own knockoff games. Uh, there was Street Fighter 2 and they had their own version called Fighter's History. In any medium, when something takes off, guess what? It's going to establish a genre that tons of other creators want to actually hop on. Capcom naturally sued and lost the case and that really established that video games were more like movies or TV instead of just a toy. It's okay to kind of pay homage or copy something that's really popular. One potentially dangerous case that could have destroyed video gaming forever was between Midway and Arctic. Arctic was a company who basically ripped off games. I mean, they made Pac-Man, Rally X, pretty much down to the letter. Same characters, same sounds. Sometimes they didn't even change the name. When they got sued, what Arctic said was, since video games are kind of transitory experiences, I could go left this time, I could go right that time. They're not the same twice. Therefore, according to the letter of copyright law, you can't actually copyright them. Because the game's different every time you play it, there's no single experience to copyright. And the prosecution was like, oh, yeah, it's actually a, a valid point. When copyright law was last visited in 1976, it wasn't really accounting for video games as this new medium. And so 
Arctic International basically said video games cannot be copyrighted as an audiovisual work. These guys had obviously done their homework. They knew what they were going to say before they went into court. They knew they had a rock solid argument. But the judge was smart enough to recognize that even though they were interpreting the law literally, they weren't really in the spirit of the law. It, it was this verdict that actually laid um, a significant precedent for video games, right? For games to be respected and protected as works of art. So Arctic had another product. It was a speed up board for Galaxy and you'd plug it into your arcade machine and make the game go faster, which was kind of cool. They got sued and they lost that case also because it was determined that theirs was a derivative work. Unfortunately, to make this Galaxian speed up board, they had to use some of Galaxian's code, which is definitely illegal. The code itself is protected as a literary work, even then. This issue of can you alter other people's work came up again in 1990 with The Game Genie by Galoob. Anyone that owned the original Nintendo probably remembers The Game Genie. It was a big deal when it came out. It was this connector that went between the game and the system itself. And when you turn the system on, you'd have a chance to enter some codes. And it would give you all kinds of cheats. Unlimited lives, invincibility, new weapons and ammo, all kinds of cool stuff like that. This is kind of the beginning of people modifying games. Now you can do it with a patch or in software usually. Back then, the only way to modify a Nintendo game was with this game Genie, and Nintendo did not like that. Unlike the Arctic case, Nintendo loses because the Game Genie is something that you use after a purchase. So the courts determined that if a customer buys something, they own it, and they can do with it whatever they want after it's theirs. So the important legal concept discovered here was that video games are protected under the same fair use laws as any other artistic medium. Once you had that cartridge, you could take it home and play it in the machine. You could put it in the box on the shelf and just look at it. You could put it in a sandwich and eat it. You owned it. You could do whatever you wanted with that physical product. It's as if you bought a movie and for some reason you wanted to re-edit it just for your own use. You didn't want to sell it. You just want to re-edit it. That's obviously legal. Same principle here. It's fair use. Nintendo, of course, did not want to hear this. They appealed the case and they lost and they tried to appeal it all the way up to the Supreme Court which refused to hear the case sticking a fork in this once and for all. It's interesting because now the way they get around it is many games have you sign an end user license agreement when you start off. Most games, especially computer games, will make you agree to a long document that you never read before you can actually play the game. So you scroll down to the bottom you hit I agree. What you're actually doing is giving away your firstborn child and any right to use the game in the way you want. They're saying you have to use it our way. The whole the issue of once you bought the game, you can do whatever you want comes up again in 1987 with Blockbuster and Nintendo. Blockbuster was renting movies and then, you know, with the video game boom at the time, decided to start renting Nintendo video games. Nintendo says, hey, people are renting games, not buying them. We're going to lose out. We're going to find some way to sue these guys. Well, they lose because, you know what? Blockbuster bought them. They can do whatever they want with them. But then Nintendo, out of spite, goes after Blockbuster and says, well, what about the manuals? Blockbuster made a habit of photocopying their manuals. So that they lost the manual, which I think I lost like the Simon's Quest and Metal Gear manual. Well, I didn't lose them, but really bad things happened to them. Um, they'd be backed up. Nintendo was like, whoa, hold on a minute. You can't do that. It's copyright infringement. They were right. You can't do that. It's illegal to Xerox copyrighted material and then turn around and make money off of it as well. So Blockbuster still had the right to rent games, they just had to put the original manuals in with them, and that's why every time you go to Blockbuster and rent a game, there's no manual in the box, because I'm a little douchebag lost it already. It's almost just like the biggest like F you from Nintendo to Blockbuster. It's like, we didn't win the big one, but you can't photocopy the manual to Clue Clue Land. So often, you would not get instructions with the games you rented. Congratulations, Nintendo, you did it. You win. And honestly, there are thousands of lawsuits like that in, in, in the video game. I mean, the video game industry has seen more lawsuits in short history than most, you know, industries probably seen in their entire lifetime. No one really saw video games coming. They kind of exploded out of nowhere. The internet was kind of a wild west for a while and there were no rules, but everyone knew the internet was coming. They've been talking about an information superhighway forever. Video games really came out of nowhere. Nobody would have thought that 20, 30 years ago, there would be all of this commotion about a video game. It's like one of those things where you're like, I just made a digital image move on a television screen. And now you have billions of dollars pumped into development, design, marketing, and litigation. At this point in 2008, the rules that govern what you can and can't do legally with video games are pretty well established. It's just too big for Sony to be putting out their own version of like Super Blario and getting away with it. You know, it took two, three decades of brutal lawsuits to get there, but that's where we are now and you know, we'll see if it holds up. Yeah! 
all original shows, all in HD, from onnetworks.com.